Meanwhile, back at the ranch is a cliche we've all heard. Originally, I found it was a subtitle that was shown in silent films. That's where it first came from. It was also used in radio dramas where scene changes had to be signaled verbally, of course. Later, it would, of course, become a catchphrase in westerns and cowboy shows where our heroes were carrying on with their duties and adventures, sometimes unaware of what was happening on the other side of the prairie. Or maybe not the prairie. It was news to me to find out that Bonanza... Does anyone know where the show Bonanza was set? Well, yeah, Lake Tahoe. It was set, the Ponderosa Ranch is at Lake Tahoe. What? I did. <laughs> Lake Tahoe, where... It, Nevada? I was so confused when I learned that, but it's true. Anyway, in the last few chapters of Acts, some monumental things have been happening, amazing things. For example, the foremost enemy of the church has been converted and is on his way to becoming a great apostle in one of the most epic origin stories of all time, really. Another thing that's happened is the door of salvation has been flung wide to all the nations of the earth. Revival has broken out in Samaria of all places. People are being healed and raised from the dead. Angels are appearing. People are having visions. A lot of big things. Though the story Luke is telling has focused mostly on a few individuals like Peter or Philip, a bit of Saul of Tarsus, it's clear that God's work was not just localized. We've been seeing his astounding providence on display as people from far and wide are being drawn to him to hear the magnificent news that Jesus Christ has in fact made a way for men and women to be saved. And what a comfort it is to know that our God has left no corner of this world unnoticed, no stone unturned in his desire that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Tonight, as we go home to lay our heads down to get that sleep we so desperately need day in and day out, we can be sure that our God is not slumbering. He's still busy. He's still working. He's still unfolding his plan and his will by his grace through his people in all sorts of different ways. And that is a comforting thought. Luke has made our eyes wide with what God is capable of doing through just a few humble people, people like Peter and John, people like Philip and Stephen, but now in the second half of chapter 11, he gives us a meanwhile back at the ranch moment, and he shows that the work of the gospel wasn't only being accomplished by a few leaders in the church of Jerusalem, but by many as each average Christian went moving through the world, sharing the truth of Jesus as they went and being a part of that upside down uh, activity that was happening throughout the world. As Luke widens the lens tonight, we'll see the start of a brand new local church, a church plant, we might say, how it operated. But it's not presented to us as a model to be mimicked or pantomimed, but it's presented as a demonstration, an exhibition of what God can do in the lives of people who love him, are full of his spirit, and submitted to his word. In the context of the book, we'll also see that God was beginning a long and consequential work in a new place. Antioch. It was the capital of Syria, one of the most remarkable cities in the Roman Empire at the time. As the Lord established a new thing in that place, we'll see many roads from near and far leading to this city and to the church there. It became sort of a ministry magnet for a time. So we begin in verse 19 and we see, now those who had been scattered as a result of the persecution that started because of Stephen made their way as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. Many commentators are quick to suggest that the dispersion of Christians out of Jerusalem was really a result of the church's failure to take up the Great Commission. These commentators say that God had to jumpstart his bride who had fallen into a rut, was refusing to do what they were supposed to do, and then looking at Luke's pivot to focus on the story in Antioch in the coming chapters, they go further and say that because of the, the church in Jerusalem was still failing, God moved his base of operations up north to a city in Syria because, after all, the 12 in Jerusalem were a bunch of losers is, is the subtext there. I've got a few issues with this sort of perspective. I hope you do too. First of all, we're given no such assessment from the Lord in the word of God itself. You know, God is not shy when it comes to calling out his people and calling uh, wrong, wrong. 
Uh, The Lord doesn't make it a habit in his word of covering over, sweeping under the rug things that his people did without, uh, without calling them on it. In fact, much the opposite. And nowhere in the book of Acts do we have anybody saying, oh, and by the way, the church in Jerusalem was a failure, and that's why everyone got scattered out. Second, church history records that the 12 did carry the gospel far and wide. They weren't just secluded to Jerusalem for the rest of their lives, unwilling to go and speak the name of their Lord elsewhere. John went to Asia, Andrew to the Scythians and the Thracians, Bartholomew and Thomas went to India, Peter went to Bithynia, Cappadocia, and to Italy. I mean, these guys were taking the gospel far and wide. Third, dividing out the Jerusalem church as a failure is just an entirely graceless attitude, the kind of lack of grace that these commentators are accusing the leaders in Jerusalem of having. Instead, we might look from this perspective. God was obviously doing many things, not just throughout Jerusalem and not just throughout the region of Judea, but now increasingly around the Roman world. We've seen his work going to Ethiopia. We're seeing his work going to Cyprus and to Antioch. It's going out far and wide. Luke, as an author, cannot tell every story about what happened in these first years of the church. He doesn't pretend to. He's leading us into part two of his Acts account, which will largely center on his traveling companion, the Apostle Paul. And in doing so, he shows us how God can use any of us to do kingdom work. Listen, in any book, and the books of the Bible are are the same, the person writing can't write everything about every aspect of the story and every character in the story. Sometimes my kids, when we're reading books to them, especially like chapter books, they'll say, well, what happens? Why did blah, 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 blah? And it's some secondary character. Well, what what happened then with that character? They say, well, yeah, we don't know. Well, why not? I say, well, we can't, they can't just keep writing and writing and writing. The book would never end. In fact, John says in his gospel, I suppose if we tried to write down everything just that Jesus said and did, the whole world couldn't contain the books. And so this idea that, well, the church has pivoted to Antioch and that's because Jerusalem was a failure because look, now this is the story that's being told. Luke's telling a story recounting the beginning of things that happened to O. Theophilus, right? And he started at the beginning, focused largely on Peter and the folks around him. And now the second part of his second book to Theophilus is gonna focus on his traveling companion, Paul, the man that he worked with as a missionary. And so it makes complete sense. It doesn't mean that God was done using Jerusalem or done using the people there or disgusted with them and they're, you know, some kind of failure, Uh, That's just a bad attitude as far as I'm concerned. These Christians here in verse 19 on the run from persecution are a great example of the wonderful truth that wherever we go, God can use any of us to do kingdom work. It wasn't God who scattered them out. Luke says outright it was a result of persecution. To say that it was a tool used by God on purpose to motivate his church is to make our Lord like the abusive husband who beats his wife when he doesn't like the way she cooked the potatoes. Who could think such a horrible thing about God our Father? Rather, in the book of Job, we read this. Indeed, it is true that God does not act wickedly and the Almighty does not pervert justice. Saul, before becoming a Christian, an enemy of Christ, he had hoped to shatter the church and sweep it into the waste bin of history. Instead, his impact caused believers to scatter like seeds everywhere they went. It reminds us that the Christian life and its gospel work can be carried out no matter the setting. No matter what the backdrop is on the scene of your life, you can live out your Christianity and carry on gospel work. You can do the Lord's work while living large or while running for your life. You and I can minister when we feel strong or when we feel weak, whether we're in headwinds or tailwinds. Because God is always the same, his truth is always sure, and his spirit is always with us. Acts on the whole shows us the incredible adaptability of the Christian life. We find the Christian life growing and bearing fruit in dungeons, on the seashore, lost in the ocean, in palaces, among friends, among enemies. And so wherever you're making your way in life, you're to do so as a spirit-filled agent of grace. Now in this case, we see that these believers who were all Jewish, had dispersed through the Roman Empire, but at this point they were only speaking 
to Jews. We've talked about this issue at length in our last few studies, so we won't retread too much here, but suffice it to say, while we don't condone their behavior, we certainly can identify with it. You know, for most of us, it's not easy to interact with people who are very, very different than us, people that are not like us. Human beings group into like kinds, right? That's just the way that things happen. It's a very unusual person who feels comfortable around any other kind of person. But we remember that it is God's intention that we be a light to the whole world, not just to those like us. We're not to hide our lamp under a basket of who's like me, but to let it shine. And that means sharing with those who are not like us. And so we want to invite the Lord to help us have a greater ease with those who are not like us so that we can speak to them about our Savior. Verse 20 says, but there were some of them, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, proclaiming the good news about the Lord Jesus. Such a simple choice made an incredible difference. These folks from Cyprus and Cyrene show great courage here. It would have been tough to be Jewish believers bringing the gospel to the pagan Gentile world. You know, there was no knowledge of the gospel of Jesus up here in Syria. I mean, we are so fortunate to live in a time where, I mean, in, in one sense, not everyone has been preached to, but the world has been saturated by the message of Christianity, right? The Bible is the number one best-selling book of all time every year, right? Uh, if, when they do polls and say, what are the five world religions? Christianity always has the largest number of adherents. It doesn't mean all of those people are born again, but the world has been saturated by the message of Jesus Christ in one sense. But here you have these Jewish believers. They're on their run, on the run for their lives, and they're going to a place that doesn't know anything about anything. They don't know anything about you know this Hebrew God or this Hebrew Messiah. Um, these are weird, pagan, gross polytheists doing all kinds of weird pagan stuff. And you're a, you know, a good Hebrew who has grown up and realized that Jesus is a Messiah. You've given your life to him. You're full of the Holy Spirit. These are all concepts that would be not only foreign, but just uh, otherworldly in a sense to uh, many of the people in, in the Roman world. And so uh, a lot of courage here. Would have been a difficult, difficult audience to preach to. These people were uh, about as far as you could get from, uh, from knowing about the Lord and knowing about sin and salvation and those sorts of things. And don't forget the fact that Jewish culture had trained these individuals to resist and separate from Gentiles at all costs. But here, these nameless Christians thought to themselves, you know, this information that I have about Jesus and about the Savior isn't just good news for a few people, it's good news for everyone. The gospel is for everyone. It's for everywhere, every place, every class, every strata, every ability. Kings or cripples. Uh, and these men from Cyprus and Cyrene step out into absolutely uncharted territory to let the Greek people of Antioch in on the secret. And what did they share? What did they tell them about? They talked about Jesus. They talked about who he is and what he had done. That's what the good news is. The good news of the gospel is not how you live your best life now. It's about our king, Christ Jesus. That's what it's about. Language scholars point out that Luke used a term here when he said began speaking, a specific term. It's a word that refers to simple speech, the common conversation of traveling people. It wasn't formal. It wasn't rehearsed. It was just people talking to people. You know, as we go, we want to try to find ways to speak casually about the Lord and his kingdom, and then we'll see whether those words might not fall on ready soil, so soil ready to accept uh, the word of God and and uh, hear the message of salvation. Verse 21 says, the Lord's hand was with them and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. The Christian life is a hands-on thing. God's hand on us, our hands on the plow as we do personal work engaging with actual people around us. It's a strange thing that the world is every day becoming technologically more and more connected. 
Very easy to connect with people on the other side of the world in one sense because of technology, but that same technology makes it all the easier for each of us to become isolated and withdrawn, interacting not really with individuals, but just with screens, just with keyboards and zeros and ones. Just as we wouldn't want God to automate his work in our lives, we want to be careful not to disengage from true face-to-face, hands-on interaction with others. Now, here we see a great number of people not only believing what they're being told about Christ, but turning to him in response. The gospel requires not only intellectual agreement, but the choice to repent, turn from sin toward God in obedience and worship, and own Jesus as king. Uh, To believe is to do both of those things, to say, I agree in my head and I turn with my heart to God, forsaking all others and bowing my knee to Jesus Christ. And here we see it happening in large numbers, but we notice it was happening organically. We're not even told the names of the people who are there sharing the faith uh, in Antioch. We're not even given the impression that they have really gathered together as a church yet. They're just individuals who are on the run for their lives. They decide to go to Antioch for whatever reason, and as they're there, they're casually talking with people, sharing the gospel, explaining who Jesus is and what he's done, and now large numbers of people are becoming Christians. What they're not doing, the, the, the believers who are evangelizing, they weren't trying to just replicate the Samaritan revival. They didn't say, hey, I heard this happen, so let's copy what Philip did and see what happens. They were just living out their faith, and as a result, the Spirit yielded a great harvest. As these Greeks became believers, we know that there was very little that was being offered to them at the church level. Uh, the ministries available were very simple and minimal, right? Right? But who among us wouldn't want to be a part of this passage? Who among us wouldn't want to be there on a Sunday morning at the Church of Antioch here as this revival was breaking out? Sometimes we start to think that we need certain styles or mechanisms or segmentations for proper ministry to be done, but Acts refutes that idea wholesale. It's not necessarily wrong to have a style of ministry. It's not wrong to have a targeted ministry, but there is an idea out there that, well, People won't respond to the gospel unless you, you know, scratch a particular kind of itch they have. They won't respond to the gospel unless you give them a group that it looks like them and that appeals to them and that is styled for them. But the book of Acts just turns that idea into garbage and says, you know, what, what you need is the Holy Spirit doing a work and he works through people who are willing and who are full of him and who are going out and telling people in love the truth of what Jesus has done. Verse 22 says, news about them reached the church in Jerusalem and they sent out Barnabas to travel as far as Antioch. Why Barnabas? It turns out to be a really good choice, but it doesn't seem like the obvious one. Previously, when they had heard about a revival in Samaria, what did they do? They sent Peter and John. We also know that Nicholas, one of the seven chosen to serve back in Acts chapter 6, he was from Antioch, and so he had a position of leadership in the church. It seems like maybe he would have been a good guy to send. Hey, go back to your hometown and take the reins up there. We don't know what or why. Uh, we didn't, we're not given the, a microphone on the deliberations of, of the people in Jerusalem, We can be confident that the Holy Spirit was drawing Barnabas into this good work, that the Holy Spirit had set apart Barnabas for this work. Um, But again, all of this points to not a programmatic method that people should copy. What, What all of this points to is the Holy Spirit is doing things, and you have a bunch of Christians who are receptive to the Holy Spirit and ready to follow after him and do what he asked them to do. We wouldn't pick Barnabas, probably. Not our first pick. We'd pick Peter and John or one of the other 12. And then, short of him, well, how about this guy over here? He knows Antioch. He can go back and do all these things. But no, it was Barnabas, and it's a good thing it was. The leadership sent him in response to what they had heard on what looks like a short-term missions trip. He wasn't going simply because he wanted to, but because he was under authority of the apostles and part of a local fellowship. God gives us the connections like those in the church on purpose so that we're not just following our own emotions or our own whims, but part of a collective work and having people around us who can help sharpen us and help uh, keep us you know, following after the Lord and keep us uh, accountable in all those sorts of things. Verse 23 says, when he arrived and saw the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged all of them to remain true to the Lord with devoted hearts. 
How can you see the grace of God? Apparently, it's possible. We know what Luke means here, of course. It was obvious that these new Christians were full of godly character, full of spiritual fruit. You could see the joy on their faces. You could see compassion in their behavior. Isn't it an interesting thing that we show emotion on our face? Emotion's not a physical commodity in one sense, but uh, it, it works itself out through the face. What do our muscles have to do with anger or with happiness? And yet, you can see a person 50 feet away and take stock and say, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh, maybe that guy doesn't want to be talked to. The question demanded uh, demanded of us by verse 23 is this. When people look at us, when people look at Calvary Hanford as a group of Christians, what do they see? Is it grace? I hope so. I really hope so. Let's think of the most negative example I can possibly think of, Westboro Baptist Church. That's the group that in the name of Jesus used to be in the the news a whole lot more. They haven't been around very much. They're that group that hold vile signs up at funeral talking about how much God hates people and how happy he is that they're gonna burn in hell and those sorts of things with obscene images and vile words being used on there all saying that they are representing Jesus Christ. No one anywhere sees the grace of God in that group because it's not there, right? So that's the most negative example I can think of of a group of people who claim to be following Christ saying, okay, well, let's, let's take a look here. If I'm Barnabas, what do I see? Grace? Nope. And so now let's turn that sword onto ourselves and say, well, as Calvary Hanford, what do people see? It's not that we're chasing the opinion of the public around us, but it's an honest question that we should ask. As an individual Christian, as a family of Christians, as a local fellowship of believers, what do people see when they look at us? Is God's grace seen in us? Grace has long been one of the defining aspects of the Calvary Chapel style of ministry. As a group, we wanna cling to that style, to cling to the prominence of grace in the way that we do things and apply it not just institutionally or, or organizationally, but to our own faith as individuals. What a great commendation that we see here in verse 23 that someone showed up and said, you know what those people have? They have God's grace. Barnabas stepped into a leadership position in Antioch. It's unsurprising. He's gonna be listed as an apostle himself in Acts 14. To this brand new group of Christians, here's what this uh, wonderfully spiritual man in a leadership position full of the Holy Spirit, here's what his assignment for them was, remain true to the Lord with devoted hearts. That's what they needed. They didn't need a capital campaign. They didn't need a strategic program. Abide in Jesus. Continue in grace. Keep moving forward. Devoted is the one used of the showbread in the temple. The showbread was dedicated to the continual service of Yahweh day by day while being in his presence. That's what this church plant needed. Barnabas showed up and said, hey, you guys, I'm Barnabas. Most of you have been Christians for about 10 seconds. I'm Barnabas, and you know the Lord's you know, put me in this position of leadership. I'm full of the Holy Spirit. And uh, you know what you guys need to do? Continue. Abide in Christ. That's the best thing that uh, could happen for this young church. Now, Barnabas' example here shows us the significance and essentialness of good leadership in the church. Imagine if some brute had come from Jerusalem or some man seeking prominence for himself, someone who wanted to lord over a group of people. Think of the damage someone like that would have done. Instead, this is what we're told about Barnabas. Verse 24, he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and large numbers of people were added to the Lord. Bible students know that eventually we're gonna get to Acts 15 where Paul and Barnabas will divide and go their separate ways. But here, writing long after that fact, we see Dr. Luke, who was himself on Team Paul, uh, he held no grudge against Barnabas, no hard feelings. He had no bitterness towards him, and that's a wonderful thing. Why were people added to the Lord in this situation? It was through grace-filled preaching. They weren't added through argument or bribery or entertainment, but through the proclamation of the gospel. Now, Christians and churches do need to have answers to arguments. We need to always be ready to give a defense, the New Testament says. We do need to be full of joy and anticipation. We should be excited to gather together. But when we're taking a look at the methods of our ministry, we should always remember that our goal is grace. Listen, numbers aren't our business as far as the New Testament is concerned. 
They're God's business. It doesn't mean we don't care about the way we present ourselves or we don't try to make an environment that is inviting. That doesn't mean that we don't have a responsibility to go out and share, right? But as far as the, the effectiveness of ministry on a numeric level, that is God's business. It is not our business. Why do some churches have 1,000 people and some churches have 100 people? I don't know. When, when both of those churches are good Bible teaching churches, people who are seek, seeking after the Lord, hey, I don't know. That's not our business to know. It's not our business to say, okay, well, we've decided that the church in Hanford needs to be 1,000 people. Okay, well, maybe God decided it needs to be 100 people. Or maybe God decided it needs to be 10,000 people. Sometimes you hear about these goals and these campaigns and these ideas that people have. Where did these numbers come from? Who had that idea? Uh, you know, it's just such a strange thing. It is the Lord's business. Uh, our goal is grace. Our part is to abide and continue and allow the Lord to give the increase. Verse 25, then he went to Tarsus to search for Saul. One commentator pointed out, apparently in Antioch they had a lot of evangelists, but no teachers. At some point, Barnabas decided he was going to need to bring on a partner to help with the ministry. Sending a letter wouldn't do because apparently no one really knew where Saul was. What an amazing thing. No one knew where the man who we call the Apostle Paul was. He wasn't on the radar. No one kept in touch. No one was checking in. Uh, that's pretty amazing. It had been quite a few years since he had come to Jerusalem and then had to run for his life and went back home to Tarsus. So Barnabas went to find his old friend and bring him back to Antioch. We should note there wasn't a dry committee formalism to the way things were done. Barnabas didn't have to send an official request to Jerusalem and then bid out the job or anything like that. The local church in Antioch, though part of the universal work, was being operated as an independent entity. Unified in spirit, of course, submitted to the same doctrine, yes, but led particularly by the spirit through local leadership. Verse 26 says, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught large numbers. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. As leaders, they dedicated their time to teaching people about doctrine, about God's word, about living the Christian life. Now, this is what had happened back in Acts 2 after Pentecost as well. They devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine. The Jerusalem church first began, and that was the foundation. In fact, Paul would later write in one of his epistles that God's house is built upon the foundation of teaching, the foundation of the apostles' doctrine. From a right understanding of God's word then flows the necessary growth in a church. Individually, the Christians needed to abide and continue in the Lord. Organizationally, as a church, that was going to be best accomplished as people were taught and had God's word rightly divided and explained to them. From that base grew the rest of the building. We're told that the disciples were first called Christians here in Antioch. Perhaps you've heard that the word means little Christ, but there's actually no evidence of that. I'm sorry. That's made up. It's a pet project of ours to ruin things that are made up. So <laughs> that's just made up. Now, the sentiment we understand, but it's made up. That's not what Christian means. The term is simply a compound, which means belonging to the party of Jesus Christ. But man, what a beautiful reminder that is. We belong to Christ. We belong to him. Sometimes it's not so much, but a few years ago there was a debate that would happen in the church sometimes that Christian has a bad connotation as a word now. It has a lot of baggage with it, and so we should become Christ followers. I would rather belong to Christ than just be somebody who's trailing behind a guy up the road. Now, I understand what they mean, and if people want to call themselves Christ followers, I have no problem with that. Of course, we're to follow Christ, but I love this image. We belong to Christ. We are his, his treasure, his friends, his beloved, the sheep of his hand. He's not just some guy who we're impressed with and he's disinterested and I guess people are following me and I'm going down the road and if people are back there, whatever. And I know people who, who embrace the term Christ follower don't think that, but Christian is a fine word. And you know, maybe the Roman world used it in a derogatory way. A lot of scholars think that they did 
But you know what? They had a derogatory sense for it originally, and the Christians said, yeah, you know what? We're Christian. We belong to Jesus Christ, and that's just fine with us. It was evident of the believers in Antioch that they belonged to Christ. It was clear that they weren't just some new philosophy. They weren't just a sect of Judaism. They were Christian. Their belief system led to a visible life change. They were no longer Antiochians, right? When people looked at them, they didn't say, hey, you're Antiochian. They, they, that was gone. They didn't look like that anymore. They looked like Christians. They were set apart. They were different. It was noticeable. It was visible. They are an inspiration to us in a world where sometimes Christians are looking more and more indistinguishable from the world and the world culture around them. Verse 27 says, in those days, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and predicted, that by, uh, predicted by the Spirit that there would be a severe famine throughout the Roman world. This took place during the reign of Claudius. Though the Christians in Judea would be the ones hit hardest by this famine, God sent prophets up to Syria to sound the alarm. Why? Well, because these people in Antioch would be in a position to send help. And because it's God's plan to make us aware of the needs of others and to be a part of bringing relief to them. We live in such a time right now. A lot of needs, near and far. And the Lord gives us opportunities to be a part of bringing relief. We know God gives us opportunity to bear in each other's burdens, to show generosity to those in need. What we've seen again and again in Acts is not that we need to figure out some scheme or one-size-fit-all approach to ministry, but simply to invite the Lord to lead us as to what to do in response to the needs that are brought to our attention, be they near to us or far from us. We also note a very important aspect of this exercise of prophecy a person made a prophecy claiming to have a revelation from God, and then what he said actually happened. That's important. There are many folks today who claim to have a prophetic ministry, to be speaking forth the word of God. Uh, there's some pretty easy ways to tell if they're true or false. But here we're noticing a magnetism in Antioch at the time. People are streaming in from Africa, from the island of Cyprus. Saul is coming, Barnabas is coming, prophets have come. God was doing something great and wonderful in this city. He was just getting started. And though that specific work has since faded, Antioch's not anything anymore, we do ask the Lord to do a new work like it, maybe in our own city. The church, having heard the prophecy, asked, what should we do? Verse 29, each of the disciples, according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brothers and sisters who lived in Judea. They did this, sending it to the elders by means of Barnabas and Saul. There was a coordinated effort, yes, but it was all based on individual leading and personal sacrifice. Each Christian sought the Lord as to how he or she could participate in the cumulative work of sending relief. We recognize that the Lord's army is a volunteer army, working together towards specific goals, on particular missions with one another, yes, but as soldiers, we are not conscripted. God doesn't hold a gun to our heads and say, you better do this or else. We are given commands, we're given callings, we're given opportunities, and then the Lord waits for an answer. Who will go? Who will give? Who will be Christ to those in need? That's the call that goes out day after day. May our answer ever be, here am I, Lord, send me. Not according to the designs of man, but by the leading of God the Holy Spirit. These Gentile Christians did not withhold from their needy Jewish brothers, and what a beautiful thing that is. You know, the Jews at first had held back the gospel from the Greeks, but the walls kept coming down. The church was unified and connected, and so when help was needed, they sent relief according to each one's ability, and as this church in Antioch grew, they were able to make a big difference in the lives of those in Judea who desperately needed it. And we see how quickly the Lord was able to establish this fellowship in this city and cause it to thrive. In verse 19, Jerusalem sent them exiles. By verse 30, Antioch is sending back apostles of their own. What a great work of God. There's a lot going on all over the world. Meanwhile, we're here on our ranch, the place where God has planted us. The best thing we can do, the most essential thing, is to abide in Christ and continue in the submissive study of his word, to operate in grace, 
As we do, the Holy Spirit will help us. He will direct us. He will supply us and then send us as he continues his wonderful work all over the world. We pray that his work in our lives, in our church, in our city would be dramatic and would be lasting as he did in Antioch. The size and scope is his business. Ours is to continue in our devotion to Jesus, operating in grace, doing what we can as he leads and thereby being a bright light in a very dark world.